Hey y'all, this is Corey Mitchell uh, coming at you, coming to you this time from my living room. Um, I said it on Facebook um, when it was able to announce this show that this was going to be a barn burner and I really meant it. I'm so excited about our guests tonight who are joining us to talk about theater. Um, up first, we have the amazing, amazing Sharon Washington. Um, she has been an actress for years in New York, and she's one of those that you have seen on television and seen in the movies all the time, and you think, wow, I've seen her before. And now you're going to hear from her tonight um, from Joker, as well as um, Scottsboro Boys, and her own show, and we'll be talking about that too, called Feeding the Dragon. Our second guest this evening is LaShawns. And it's, um, you know that you're a diva when you only have to have one name. And that one name encompasses so much um, from way back doing um, Once on This Island to just this past season doing Summer, uh, the Donna Summer musical. And finally, we have, oh, also Tony winner as Seely for The Color Purple. And finally, we have, um, I said there were just too many hyphens for him. We have Coleman Domingo, actor, singer, director, um, I probably producer at this point, writer, gardener. And we're going to talk about it. I'm going to ask him if he's a reverend next. So please um, help me welcome all of our guests two perspectives tonight. I'm so happy to see you. Hey. Hey. Hello. Hi. How are y'all doing? Good. Good. Well, I want to begin with some happy news. Do I need to call you Reverend Domingo? You actually do. You can call me the good Reverend Doctor. That's, <laughs> that's the truth. I'm, I, I'm a reverend and a doctor. So, yes. So, so, <laughs> yes. yes, it is true. I did marry uh, my friends Nisi Nash and Jessica Betts uh, this past weekend. And I am a doctor. I just got an honorary doctorate from your sinus college. So mm -hmm. I'm the right reverend. I'm the right reverend. Good Dr. Wait. Coleman. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, right I'm reverend. The <laughs> right reverend. Is that right, Sharon? The right, the reverend. right reverend. Good doctor. <laughs> I love it. That's I'm fantastic. Trying to pour blessings all over everybody. That's it. Thank it you. Is I'll take them. Yes. It's so yes. good to see you all this evening. Um, so I guess I want to start off now, since we started happy, I want to talk sad for just a second mm. um, because um, I don't know about you, but I am still just completely shaken over the passing of uh, Brother Chadwick Boseman. Yeah. And um, I know um, that you've worked with him personally on a couple of um projects, haven't you, Coleman? Uh, yeah, well, I first met Chad. I think we all knew Chad in, in, uh, in one way or another between LaShawns and Sharon and I. And um, I met him when I first did, we did a reading a thousand years ago at New York mm -hmm. Stage and Film. And it's funny, I've always known him to be, it's funny, I think the idea of calling him an actor almost limits him, because mm -hmm. I feel like he was kind of a prophet because mm -hmm. he was always talking about things. I feel like even in process, he wasn't even talking about acting. He was talking about humanities and people and culture and art and yoga and food. And so I think that that's the way I knew him. And yeah, we just uh, we just completed uh, his last film, uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom with George Wolf directing um, that we all had worked with. And um, we are, and we, it's coming out this coming fall, early winter. And I, it's, it's devastating. I'm, I spoke to Sharon was one of the first people I spoke to. Uh, Sharon's like my sister. And, um, and it's devastating. It's devastating, as I think we all know, in our community. We just knew what he was doing in such a short period of time, right? He was just like, and it feels like that was part of it. He had so much to do and to play these incredible icons and to leave an indelible mark. And so we're all left with it to, you know, to re-examine and look at like, you know, wow, it is, you know, at 43 years old, he accomplished so much. And so it's like, don't take anything for granted. If you're going to write it, write it. If you're going to do it, do it. You'll produce it, produce it. But don't wait, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I guess we'll leave it there. Mm. Uh, 
And um, yeah, it, it's every time when I see some of the tributes and people are so brilliant about pulling together clips of him, of like his work and um, not just his work on the screen, but his work off the screen and him as a person. Um, it just makes me sad that um, someone that good, that great as a person has. Uh... But, but you know, I also want to add something to it, Corey. I think that I was talking about this earlier, the fact that like I did not know how sick he was and how he was right. undergoing treatment like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a, again, I think it's like to look at, I mean, sometimes I feel like I look at them, please, I can watch LaShawn's and, and Sharon Washington on stage and think that they're superheroes because what I believe we do, you know, mm -hmm. when we're in tune and what we are required to do, takes mm -hmm. superhuman strength. And then on top of it, you have a debilitating illness like Chad did and he's, mm -hmm. he's still got, like I never knew, none of us knew, Denzel Washington didn't know. None of us knew how ill he was. So I think it's sort of, as well as the sadness, I think it's also inspiring to see what the human spirit can do when you put your mind to it. Because he was, yes. he was not, he was not going out of here without getting some things done. It mm -hmm. seems, you know. That's and right. To your point, and to your point, Coleman, you know, when you say he was not just an actor, I do feel I never, I never met him. I never had an occasion for our paths to cross, but I felt like I knew him. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just felt like I knew him. I felt like I really knew him. Just listening to the commencement speech he gave at Howard, just listening to all the comments he would make, his interviews. He was so, so, um, so approachable. So we, I felt like I was in the room with him. And a lot of his words were prophetic, the things mm -hmm. he spoke about. And now that we're seeing all the clips of him, you know, with different sound bites of what he says, what he has said, it just is moving, and and even even more, it, it makes the loss even greater, because he was such a force in the world for good, and 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 it's a huge loss for us, a huge loss, and and but but we lift him up, we lift up his family, but That's I right. can't say that it, it has been shaped. I definitely shed tears when mm. I heard that. I was driving, mm. someone called me and told me, and I just. It really, it, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what do you mean? You know, it's very shocking. And, but yet, as you say, he kept going and none of us knew that he was ill. Yeah. You know, what also, what it made me think of is our community, hmm. our community. And we're talking about, you know, black theater tonight. And um, I did not know him personally, but I know so many people who knew him personally. And so many people we know, all of us on this uh, call right now, mm -hmm. Dominique and Dominique Morisseau and Issa Davis, and they all shared his last text or his last poem or his last, you know, so those are the kind of connections that we mm -hmm. have in this community. So he was us, right? Yeah. So that's what I love about this community. And and yet, and which is why it, it hurts so much and feels so personal. It's because honestly, I, I think people think of this as this big sort of, everybody goes off in their different directions and there's these awards and there's people go off in their different, but we really at base are a community of mm -hmm. artists yeah. that love and support each other and want each other to fly. And mm -hmm. sometimes we're not even, I was like, that was he, this text that Dominique posted was like, wow, that was like a text that I would send to Coleman or send to LaShawn. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, it's us. Yeah. And so we grieve because it's us, but it's also the beauty of us, mm -hmm. no matter where we go, no matter what we do, we're, you know, whether we're Hollywood Black Panther or doing a reading at New York Theater Works, whatever, it's we're us. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about this community. Yeah. So I just, I, that's that's what came forth was all in all the tributes was the personal. And I remember when we were talking on it, Pete, the connections we don't even know we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Do you? Yeah. Do you ever feel like there is a difference between what you're known for and what you want to be remembered for? Mm. Mm. Wow. You better come on with the tough question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The good Reverend Doctor, I'm gonna let you know. Oh Lord, you about to wear me out. <laughs> I, I, well, I think that I, I, I'll, I'll kick it off. I think that, um, first of all, let's talk about the moment that we've all been in 
which hopefully we've all been able to slow down and take stock and truly ask those questions of ourselves. What are we truly trying to leave behind? What is the imprint we'd like to make? And I think that I know that I'm very conscious of that, that ultimately what I think I'm trying to do, what I think I'm trying to do is do things to bring us together, that help us interrogate history, things that sort of like move the dial just a little bit while I, while I have breath. It's like, if it just moves the dial a little bit, so then, you know, I, I think you, you, you all want to leave an, you want to leave an impression. And I feel like I want to be known for kindness. I want to be known for generosity. I want to be known as a champion. I want, I'd like being known as an actor, director, writer is probably not as important. I think that it's more about like what I've actually been able to do on this earth with people. That's great. That's, 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 I want to add that to what I want to be known for, because that's mm -hmm. exactly right. I want to be known for being a good person, but I also, you know, the older I get and the more I see women in my, in my age bracket of a certain age, fabulous age, by the way. Okay. But I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about um, black female representation in terms of our health and our longevity. Mm. So it's important to me that I'm known for resilience and stamina. I want people to know that you can continue to go on. There is no end. You know, end when, you know, the, when our creator says it's time to end. But until then, we continue to go forward. And I want people to know that I want to be an example of continuing to go forward. And again, you know, it doesn't mean that you know, I'm not, I'm not even specifically speaking about as an actor. I mean, just in creating and in producing and in life and, and continuing to be happy and moving forward. I feel so many times I speak to some of my colleagues, not in the industry, but just some of my friends in my, in my, in my friend circle that are, that are approaching life as well. I'm getting to a certain age and I'm like, and what does that mean that mm. you're to a certain age? Does that mean that it's time to slow down? Does it mean it's time to stop? Does it, time, does it mean it's time to relinquish your power? No, I think it's time to take all that you've accumulated to this point and go on to do something else, which is what our African ancestors did. We were the griots. We were the wise ones, yeah. the ones that continue to produce well into, you know, look at, you know, Madam Tyson, if we can mm -hmm. think of someone who yeah. is an example, you know, we, we, I, I want people to know that it does not stop where we are, to continue to live fully. That's important to me. Absolutely. I, yes and amen to that and of a certain age and all, yes, yes and amen. Mm -hmm. And um, on top of that, I think I want to, I want to be known for telling more of our stories. We have so many stories to tell and whether, and as you get to a certain age and I don't, it, I don't have to be an actor. I don't have to, I don't have to do it personally, but there are so, as the older I get, I'm still surprised by the things I don't know about my own history. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm still being shocked, but I had no idea that there was this I just uh, was the Google doodle yesterday. I'm, I'll admit it. This black woman who was the first black woman cartoonist. Mm. What? Why don't mm. we hear these? What? Yeah. So my, I, I would like to be known as the one who, whether, whether I tell the stories personally or whether I find vehicles for other people to tell these stories, whether I produce the stories, mm -hmm. We have so many more than the stories that we've been allowed to tell. So I would like to be known for, oh, she was the one that told that story. I didn't know so-and-so was that black woman cartoonist. Mm -hmm. I didn't know so-and-so was the first black woman who published whatever. Mm -hmm. so that's what I want. That's what I would mm -hmm. like to do, mm -hmm. little by little. Yeah. You know, I think that, that it's so interesting. Um, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is so interesting um that um you talked about resilience because i think that is the very essence of celie johnson um mm. in the color purple and <laughs> when you talk about those secrets uh it was my understanding that that was why alice walker said she even wrote the color purple is because it was um revealing those family secrets that people keep 
for generations, for a long, long time that you find out about. But um, the real question goes into telling those stories because um, tell me about that. When the opportunities don't always present themselves, I know that all three of you, whether it's through cabaret or writing your own uh, your own pieces, um, one of the one of the ways that you've all furthered your careers has been through creating your um, your own works. So, um, how has that process been? What are the words that you say for those that are trying to do it? Well, first, I think there's got to be um, a dedication to understanding what your true purpose is as an artist, which is to create and that no one can tell you not to create. You can create from where you are, wherever you are, and you can do it. And I'm always supporting my, you know, there's somebody on this call who will probably mention the fact that I will always uh, rally for my friends to create and to think outside of the box that they're just an actor or director or writer, mm -hmm. but I feel like we can do so much more and we always have great stories to tell. And I was creating, you know, well, you know, and I feel like it's all one. I was creating my first solo show when I was bartending. And so I used the four hours when it was slow time to create this thing. And I never thought it was separate than my bartending work. I believed it was all the same. It's just being an artist mm -hmm. and this is what it looks like. And I create from wherever I am and I use whatever resources I have. They had, you know, anybody who gives anything for free, I'll take it. So you give me space, I'll come up with something. I'll put it on there and I'll invite some friends and we'll <laughs> pass the hat. So, you know, whatever it's like, you got to think old school. You got to think like, how you were doing it in your backyard or in your basement and inviting people. You guys still think that like, I'm just trying to create some stuff, invite some friends, read it, figure it out eventually. And don't think about production. You just gotta think about creating the thing that was never there before mm -hmm. and putting it out there and letting it be imperfect and just know that it will, it will, you know, refine itself. And then it'll find audiences and you'll find people who say, we love the way you tell story. And then next thing you know, you're a playwright. Basically, I'm telling my story. Next thing you know, you're a playwright. Next thing you got more stories to tell. Next, you know, and, and then you're directing, and you're writing and all that stuff. But you can create from wherever you are with no access whatsoever, especially right now. There's so much access that's generated. Just you can do it. But you can think of an idea, write it, create it, produce it. You've got a phone. You got YouTube, make it happen. Right. <laughs> you know? That's so true. I mean, it, it, it's so true. You're absolutely right. And I find, I feel that during this, you know, the pandemic, as my girlfriend likes to say, you know, this happened because it was the pandemic or this happened mm -hmm. because it was the pandemic. She, she often says that, but um, this quarantine has, has um, inspired for many of us to do just that, Coleman, to mm -hmm. create because we cannot get on the stage. You know, yeah. we're not, well, now they're starting to get back behind the camera, but, you know, we weren't able to create and do what we've done, what we were used to doing. So this has, this, this time of, of solitude or just sitting still and being forced to be in our homes and, and with our family members or some of us with, with ourselves, you know, some of us mm -hmm. with, with ourselves, that forces us to be, to look inside and think, okay, what do I want to do today? Because we don't have the noise. And what I find is that what I have found is that it has been it has been such a learning period for me about what is important and to me in terms of creativity. And I found that even just the nuggets of ideas that I've had throughout the years, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to follow that through. I have the time now mm -hmm. to follow that 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 um, inspiration. Doors open. You know, mm -hmm. people reach out. It, it's miraculous how things happen. Yeah. How, Sharon, you just mentioned the black cartoonist, and it was a light bulb that went off in my mind because I have created another platform for telling stories, but just interviewing people, kind of. And I'm like, I'm going to look up that black cartoonist because mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. not. I don't know who you're talking about. I just know that I'm inspired by that, and I think a lot of that is what's happening in the universe. I think it's a mm -hmm. universal shift for us to come back to the source, the center source of who yeah. we are so that we can, you know, when this intermission ends and we're back about to do our second act, we will be fortified with these new stories to tell. So yes. I agree yeah. that things are they're in alignment right now. So I would say, you know, to your point, continue to create and know that doors will open and look at everything that's around you and in front of you, because that is what 
you know, the creator is giving you. That's mm -hmm. the doors that are opening for you. You may not think so. You know, you may not think that, oh, well, this isn't, you know, a Broadway producer talking to me or this isn't, you know, Coleman Domingo talking to me. But this is someone that is going to get you on your journey to what you mm -hmm. are producing right now. That's so. exactly right. And I think it's that's so right. And I, I I always I feel like I'm the amen corner on this. Amen. <laughs> amen and I can my love consent. But it's also about it goes back to storytelling and and if you really feel like you have a story, and we all have stories to tell, and if you really feel like you have a story to tell, you can tell it. You, as Coleman said, there's all of these different avenues. There's a podcast. There's a you'll there's a way for you to tell your story, yeah. and, and you will be surprised. And who just picks up on that and finds that as an inspiration, and and is fired up by that. And it's just it's something. It's like. I don't know, it's like Quicksilver and somebody gets that idea and somebody gets that and it catches. Mm -hmm. And it, and that's the um that's the joy of going back to because we are storytellers. That's how we that's how we live our lives is by stories and passing on stories. And I think that's um yeah, don't let anybody tell you you don't have a story to tell. Mm. How do you know what and I want to say also is don't forget to I just I'm sorry, just one other thing. Yeah, don't, don't be afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. yeah, don't be afraid to ask. Yes. If there's someone that you know that has a little extra funds or whatever, mm -hmm. let them know that you need some support in what you're doing. Don't be afraid to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. That's right. So. so we need to talk some about the changes that need to be made. Oh. <laughs> okay. Are you um, trying to get me to flip a table? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has to have a sip. And Coleman, I I attempted to make a couple of those drinks that you made. I'm I'm not that good yet. Meteorologist <laughs> over here. Um, but <laughs> what are some of these changes? And I mean, all three of you are here at this nexus after. Um, I used to call it the awakening, and Charles Randolph Wright told me it was the rude awakening <laughs> from this summer. But um, so, all three of you, um, we've got two organizations here that are calling for it. And what, like, I know what I experience here in Charlotte, and I'm I'm looking for. Um, everyone that asks me, what do I need to do? And I make a list, but I want to hear your list. Ooh, I don't know if we got time for all that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but, but I, I, I'll kick it off and, and let these ladies um, uh, interject with me. But I think that... Yeah, and interrupt. Okay. You know, at the beginning, I think basically, I think this is a, a time for seismic change. And we're all trying to make change wherever we are. So I think whether we're out in the streets, we're about, we're about, about justice, about, you know, looking at, you know, policing, you name it. And then also we have to look at corporations and institutions that have supported these practices of anti-racist theater, you name it. Or just, you know, I'm a part of the things that I'm sure we all are, like whether it's in Hollywood, you name it. But we're just saying it's a systemic problem and we've got to break these systems down to make it more equitable you know, more diverse and more inclusion for everyone. And now that it, now we've got everybody's attention, Right. Let's get to work. And that means all of you. No, no one can sit this. I think no one can sit this out. And I think that's why there are demands. There aren't, you know, asks, but they're demands because it's, we're saying if you say Black Lives Matter, you say you're going to put out a post, whatever, we're going to hold you to it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to help you. We're going to come together and say, this is how we can help you do this work. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's there's committees upon committees and emails and people yeah. and conversations. I sit half of them out because I'm, I'm the kind of person just like, you just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I'll, I'll make the call. I'll, I'll, I'll be the rabble rouser, you name it. But we're a, a part of these, a, a part of these uh, movements and, and e even as individuals where we're trying to just move the dial to a place that is a bit more equitable with the diversity and inclusion for everybody. Mm -hmm. Am I right, LaShawn, yes. Sharon? Yes. I, I mean Absolutely. We agree. Sharon, you wanted to hop in? No, I was just going to say, I was just going to piggyback on that and then I'll pass it off to you, LaShawn. But it's it's also about, I think, for us is, you know, we've been carrying this for a long time. We being BIPOC 
artists, artists of color, black artists. And it's like, it's time for you to do the work now, mm -hmm. right? It's time for, um, and I think that's why, I think that's what has shifted is that we're always the teachers. And yes, we take it on as like, we will help and we will teach you. And that's part of who we are as artists to reach out and be understanding and help you understand. And now it's like, you know what? I've always had to know more than I need. I've always had to reach beyond who I am, what I am. I've always had to know other cultures and other ways. Now it's time for you to learn a little bit more. It's time for you to reach across and do a little bit of the work. And I think that for me, that's what's shifted in that, yes, we're here and I will help you and I will be, I will be a resource, but you've got to do the work. Mm -hmm. You've got to do the work. It's not on me anymore. And, and uh -huh. for me, that's uh -huh. shifted. Right. Yeah, and, and, and the asks are, when I tell you, just to continue with that, the asks are, they're, they're everything from the corporate level to the board of directors to you name it, to like making sure that everyone's represented, but also to the base levels of like, you know, our crew and workers and stuff like that, how things have been set up so that other, we're not invited to have seats at the table. You know, unions have been set up in many ways. They bring in their brother, their cousin, their sister. And so there's no roles or training you know, for, you know, black people and, and you know, other people to have some some some, some fair uh, inclusion and to and the, know that there's jobs available. And so it, it, there's so many, I feel like it's just breaking down and smashing. Yes. There's so many parts of this system we need to work out. Oh, yeah. And we're, and, we're, and we're actively trying to work on all of them. <laughs> yes. And I think so many of us, you know, like the We See You White American Theater group, you know, that letter, that was, that was like, listen, this is what you all need to see. You all need to understand that this is what has been happening. And we're all, we all know, we all know that these things have existed for years. And we right. all have just been, uh, as, as one of the women on our organization says, we've been complacent to a point. Complacent. Yes, I agree. That's That's I agree. Because we didn't yeah. let them know. We didn't let people know. We didn't let them know. We went right along when that person said something that was kind of foul. Come on now. Room. That's right. Always packing That's your well. hair products. Always right. packing your hair products before Pack you go to the set. That's right. Yeah. Or, or leaving the makeup trailer and going in my room and fixing <laughs> Redoing it. Redoing it. Exactly. Redoing, it. Right. Redoing it. Making sure I got my products, you know, and all those types of things. Yes. We've done because we wanted to be in the room. We wanted yeah. to be behind the, the camera or on the stage. But you know, I find it so interesting when I when I listen to some of the, the, the younger black artists or BIPOC artists coming up, what they talk about. And, and one of the things that I found really interesting was that uh, they said in, in, a, in a forum that I was on that they felt like my generation left them hanging. Mm. And I thought, well, that's interesting mm. because right. Yeah, that was that was the, the discussion was how they felt that those in our generation, when they were coming in, the generation behind us, the, the gen, are they the Ys or the Z? I think it's the Ys behind us, and then it's the Z. Mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. So um, I'm trying to get them out. I'm an X. I don't know. You're right. I think we're Gen X's, right? We're Gen X, I think. Mean. Yeah. So the Ys. Yeah. The generation before that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're an X. You are an X, solid X. Claim you are an X. <laughs> but the Y's and the Z's, they felt like we were not helping them through this process. And I had to remind them on this panel that when we came into the game, the boomers weren't saying, hey, y'all, here's your Mai Tai and your rose petals. They were examples of what needs to happen. So I think this period for us, for all of us, no matter what generation you're in, is that we are we, we are being reawakened to the, the, the um, ability to make this change, yeah. whatever level you're on. And so like, that's why we're all taking these opportunities. That's why all these organizations are popping up because we're trying to come together now and mm -hmm. really make a, ch a, a long lasting change mm -hmm. in, yes. in, in for the yeah. generations to come. I think that's so right. I just want to add on to what LaShawn says because we do, because our generation, we were more in the room than the generation before us. And so we were, we wanted to be in that room and be right and be on top of the game and be bringing it. And, half the time, I don't think we even, I didn't even realize what was on my shoulders, like what carrying your own makeup is, what right. having the responsibility of doing your own hair again is. Right. What, you, you just take it for granted. 
that that's what you do. You have your little, because you've talked to other sisters in your generation. You're like, yeah, girl, don't go on that set unless you got your stuff with you. That's right. And that was just the way it was until the next generation says, but why you have to, what, what? Why? Yeah. Why do you have to do that when the woman sitting in the chair next to you doesn't have to do that? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was, it was an awakening, I guess. Yeah. You know, it was that kind of, wow, that's true. So we've been, yeah. we've been we've been slightly complicit in that we've way. Been, we're like, I didn't say anything. Absolutely not speaking up and not. I'm like, OK, that's why I'm throwing my hat in the ring, because, you know, what what y'all going to do to me? Not hire me. OK, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like it's time for us, all of us together to say, OK, no, enough. This is this is we're going to rethink this. Yes. You know. Um, so yeah, I'd love to make a point about what LaShawn said too, because it's very interesting. Because I do feel that the younger generations, and I could get flack for this, I'm prepared, but I feel <laughs> like the younger generations that I think uh, because a lot of times I tell you, I get so many emails and DMs, you name it, people asking, you know, will you mentor me? Will help me how to do, tell me, tell me how to do this, or having access to this, you name it. And it's coming from to someone who has never done that. Mm -hmm. I felt like. I don't look for a formal mentor. Everyone's my mentor. I look to I look to people, but also I've always looked at it as you show up with what can I give to someone, not what you can take from them. Mm. You know, so people are constantly asking, yeah, can I have access to this? Could you do this? Could you make I want how do I write a solo play? Blah blah blah. blah. Will you help me do well, how about what do you what do you bring into me, first of all, as well? Mm -hmm. What do you bring in saying, OK, I love what you're doing. How can I support that? How can this work both ways in some way? You can't just be coming with your hands out and, and, and then feeling like we done left you behind because that's not the truth. What we're doing is we're standing in it. We're standing in the shit so you don't have to stand in it. Standing in the gap. We, like, we've oh, been taking the crazy. knocks. We've been taking the knocks so you don't have to get knocked over your head. So now right. you can come in and say, okay, this isn't right. Let's pick up on that. And, and, and with, especially, you know, I'm always just like, you know, I'm 50 years old. I ain't out in the streets. I need the young people to be out there and knocking things down, whatever, while I'm on my computer working with these executives, talking to them, talking their air off, telling them what they can do. So we all have a job and yeah. the young people just need to be out there to, to lift it up. And I'm preaching now. You're absolutely right, Coleman. And, and we are, we got our foot stuck in the door. Oh we're my God! Yes, yeah. that door open. And we got just a, banging on it, and we've been like, <laughs> we're trying to hold it open. Man, we are holding that door so <laughs> that it can come through. You know, that's what we've been doing. So when I hear that, I want to say, listen, I could never go to uh, Diane Carroll. God rest her soul. Yeah. I could go to her and say, Miss Carroll, um, you did not, you know. Hook me up when I first came to New York. <laughs> you know what I mean? I couldn't do that. And I think that that is a product of how, you know, mm -hmm. the generation is. But I think this time is 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 awakening for them too. To see yeah. that we all have to we all these organizations popping up, it's for a reason, but we yeah. all have it's all for the, the 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 North Star. We all have the same North Star. That's we right. And we want our, our generations, we want all we want equal representation across the board, and we don't want to have to fight for it anymore. Come on. That's it. We just we just it just is what it is. Mm -hmm. And we really don't even want to I, I mean, I, I I'm a little tired of talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like uh, we've had I've had this I've been in this business how long I've I feel like I've had this discussion, <laughs> this conversation. <laughs> right. but, yeah. I'm tired of the same conversation. So that's what I mean. It's like, we got to get beyond, like we got to do the hard work. We got to have the ugly conversations. We got to have the conversation where we're going to get mad at each other. I'm my, my black brothers and sisters, my bot, we all, it's going to, it's not going to be cute mm -hmm. coming out the other side of this because mm -hmm. everybody, you know, so, but we, we've been avoiding the hard conversations and the naming of names. Mm -hmm. And now is the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so interesting. I was on a on a Zoom last night with um with Wendell Pierce, who's also a, a founding member of Black Theater United. Mm -hmm. He he was he was sharing how because we he the comment was about the different groups and about how there's one particular group that is um approaching us for something that um that they in in a way that that's that they were not really happy with with the outcome. And he said, you know, back when Dr. Martin Luther King and all those young uh, 
uh, ministers were out trying to figure it out. There was a lot of infighting. We just of didn't course. hear about it. That's right. Yeah, we just didn't hear about it. Mm -hmm. They That's were right. struggling trying to figure out what the ACLU was doing, what this mm -hmm. organization was doing. They what were SNCC is doing. What, everybody has a different, right. they're like, SNCC yes. is like, SNCC says, this is more important for me. This is more important for us. That's the right. right. The vote is yeah. more important. Exactly. You know? I but think we all have from from mission. So mm -hmm. it, yes, yes. For me, it it seems like because they think that we are a monolith sometimes, mm. and it's like, the black is, community. Yes, and <laughs> so that I think that comes out of that. Um, yes. Since you said you're tired, I, I was just wondering: Do you ever get the blues? Oof. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Oh yes. Like what? What shade of blue do you? Why do I, why do I feel like? Why do I feel like uh, the color purple right now? I just feel like sagging. <laughs> oh Lord. <no. laughs> There's a note being played somewhere. There's a chord. There's a chord. That's right. I mean, I think I'm trying to tell you something. But <laughs> I mean, you have to, right? I think where we. I will just say, I, mean, I got to give it up to these two wonderful sisters of mine on this call. They wouldn't do what they did in such with such depth of the way the characters that they play um, if they did not have that understanding of the blues. And I know for myself as well, like we, I think we feel deeply. And when we when it hits, it hits hard. Like we're talking about, you know, Chad's passing. I said it hits all of us so hard, and we understand that. But I think we also know how to transform it into something, whether it's a song or story or memory or something, you know? And, you know, that's where I think probably that's the place where we get stuck. And I keep wondering, how do you get ourselves unstuck? And I'll be honest, there have been so many times that I couldn't help it. I just, I have just cried. Like Friday night, I cried. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help it. Mm -hmm. um, two Sundays ago, when um, CBS This Morning did that uh, story on the new um, issue of Vanity Fair, and as soon as they showed that painting for the cover of Breonna Taylor, I just, mm -hmm. I just could not help it. Mm -hmm. and so. You know, this morning um, in my class, I um, I said, how are you feeling right now? And most, you know, a bunch of the kids are like, at first I was sad, but now I'm good. And I have one child that just wrote one word to me privately in the chat, just said, depressed. Mm. And what do you say? How do we process? Because... There's been just a whole industry based on black trauma, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what we do and how we get ourselves through that and how we get ourselves past what this moment is, you know? Depression is, um, Depression yeah. is, is just, it's just, it's particularly during this pandemic. There have been days when I can honestly say I was depressed because I just woke up without a plan. And as a person who is used to a plan, if it, it, that, 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 that knowing that I did not have a plan on this particular day, it, it, it was a feeling of like, oh my God, what does that mean? Does that mean that I will never have a plan again. You know, these are just the kinds of thoughts that happen when you are, and I, and I, and, and I'm a busy, I'm a busy body. So to be still is, ooh, what's going on? You know, you know, it, it, it can be rather unnerving. Um, but depression is real. And I think that for, for so many of our youngsters who are trying to reconcile this, this, this new reality, this new normal, those that are not going back to school or going back to school or had to leave school. I have a young child upstairs that I'm trying to talk through the sadness of, of what she had to do in her freshman year of college. You know, it, it, it is something that I think needs to be addressed and discussed verbally. I think that's the number one thing that we have to tell our friends and family members and children is to talk about how they feel. 
That's number one. And, and it is no shame in it because we all feel it. We all have felt, we all have good days. We all have bad days. We all have great days. We all have terrible days. It's just a cycle of being a human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think if they know that they're not alone in mm -hmm. this, that they will be able to help uh, manage the, 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 the imbalance of this time. Oh, I think that's so important. I think that's, and especially for our young people, um, mental health and and talking to somebody, uh, you know, the old school was like, you know, you just shut up, you didn't talk about it, right? Yeah. You, you know, that it wasn't a thing. And I think we're thankfully moving pat through some very tragic things and through the, you know that yes we struggle with depression and yes we it is in our communities and yes suicide it, it's all in our like but i think it's so important that we seek help that the help is out there and that we and that we are not alone and that there is somebody to talk to and that it is universal and i was just telling some girlfriends right on the zoom before i got on this i the cup it put me to Jake, it put me to bed. Jacob Blake put me to bed. Like mm -hmm. I had to go to bed. Like literally that, like I can't take one more. And I didn't know whether I could get like it was like, why, why? Why am I getting up? For what? To create what? Why? Mm -hmm. So we all go through that. And I think again, to know that you're not alone, to seek help, to have your your community of your people you can talk to and get on the phone with those peeps and also professional folks if you need them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's cliche, but reach back and think what our ancestors went through. Mm -hmm. Come on. Say That's that. exactly it. You're like, you know, um, and you know, when white America gives somebody, gets a sniffles, black America gets pneumonia. So, you know, that's where we are. Okay. Terry has something. Terry has a question. What advice would you give? Well, you know what? Uh, this I, I can answer that for Terry, I believe. I'm actually doing a lot of teaching right now and working with a lot of young people. And and I realize that everyone, yeah, it does feel like you're in a holding pattern. Like you worked mm. and you're like, but now what? And I honestly tell you the now what is this? I've been on the phone. I've been watching what LaShawns has been doing too. Um, what we've been doing in this time. I've been doing things like gardening and cooking mm -hmm. and learning and relearning and architecture and books and all that other stuff that you actually need to have an acting career, a directing career, a writing career. You need all that life stuff. You need love, you need to fall in love, you need to be interested and interesting. And so it's a time to pour into yourselves that, that, because the education doesn't stop. Just because you got out of university doesn't mean that you were just going to go straight into auditioning and get a job. We, I, I personally would always tell students, go somewhere, fall in love, find a community, find your community. You can do it right now virtually because we can find your community all over the world now. Be a part of something. See what you can be a part of and how you can even innovate right now. Because I feel like, you know, we're all longing for being back in theater spaces. And it's not, it seems like we won't be there for a minute. But right now, instead of longing for that, why don't you, how about looking for a different way to create and to tell story and to bring people together, to use all the, that skill that you've, um, you've been trained to do. Don't let that feel, don't feel like it's for naught. You can use it um, in a way to generate something brand new and connect with people. And also it can lead you to a different direction right now. It's not saying it's all one. Right? Am I right, you guys? It's all one. Just because, like, just just because I'm out in the garden most of the time doesn't mean I'm not an actor. Because I'm like, I found something else I like to do too. Hopefully, I'll find something where I play a gardener, and then what when things are ready, you know, and film and It'll make you a better actor. It, exactly. I have I'm more knowledge. With your garden, by the way, I'm impressed with your garden. From oh, thank you so much. Oh, you know whose garden I'm impressed with is Sharon Washington. Yeah, what? but thank you, Lashawn. You stole that garden from me. <laughs> <laughs> I need to come check out your garden because I like your garden too. You found out he I had have a garden, garden. Too, you? And listen? then he yeah. had to have a garden. Suddenly he was gone. <laughs> you know what? I was inspired by all by both of you because I bought my first plant behind me oh. and it is still alive. Look at you. Look at God. Oh, Look at God. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh my goodness. LaShawn, you've been gardening too, right? 
Yeah, I plant a garden every year, and I talk about it on my Insta story. And I oh was, like, I thought I saw it. Yeah, but that time I commented on your garden. I was like, "Oh, those greens look good. Oh, good. Like, oh, they look so healthy." I had to get some greens after Sharon was going on about her greens, talking about, "Oh, they grow so wild and just cheap. Ooh, just get, yeah, go out and cut some." Mm -hmm. We'll hook yeah. up through it, Sharon. We, we, I, we, we'll hook up on that. Um, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I got to, you know, we got to share gardening. Okay. It's, it's, so what what are you the most proud of? What came out of your garden? You're the most proud of baby i have a cucumber that just showed up the other day and it showed up out of nowhere <laughs> am i right they, they just like suddenly you're like oh my god it's, and it's really too long you'll have a baseball bat <laughs> right so, yeah. that's what i'm proud of what are you proud of uh LaShawn, I, I surprisingly i had okra grow up and i didn't even plant it this year we <laughs> plant in my garden Mm -hmm. And it came up out of nowhere in the middle of my peppers, and I kept an eye on it. And I would, I would uh talk about it. Okay, well, I don't know what this is. And then I went out there the other day, and okra was growing on it. I planted oh, okra three years ago, y'all. Oh my god! And it came back this year. Wow! So healthy okra plant in the middle of my garden. Yes. Oh my god! Yes. 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 Ooh, that's corn tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> I sent some gumbo coming. Oh, yeah, <laughs> okay. How about you, Sharon? Um, I was very, and listen, I take the pictures and my husband does most of the work. So um, I'm the one posting. <laughs> the well, he's out there. <laughs> he's out there well, like, like feeling. Like, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm there. Oh, wait, baby. Look, look, move aside so I can. <laughs> so, um, we had, but we had melons. We're in Dutchess County and we had watermelons. We had about 15 cantaloupe that was slamming Ooh. and watermelon. Wow. Wow. Yes. It's, 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 that was then it's our first garden. So we're very happy. Oh, um, that's good. Back to my childhood, because my father, we had a garden on three sides of the house. And we had oh. to grow sweet potatoes that I did mm. not. I had my back to school clothes were not much. But since uh, we harvested sweet potatoes in the fall, my winter clothes were on point. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. I love it. I love so it. So that reminds me, tell me a lesson that you learned from your hometown that you still take with you to this day. Oh, wow. Mm. A lesson that I learned from my hometown. My hometown. Anyone who goes to not only Philadelphia, but specifically West Philly, you will know because I, popul I populate my plays with people from West Philly. And I think they're the salt of the earth. They're funny without even trying to be funny. They're dry. They, um, what you see is what you get. No one knows how to put on any airs in my neighborhood. And that's what I appreciate. I think that that's so I know that I carry that wherever I go. You know, it's, I'm always me wherever I go. I, I I hope I am, and I always because I feel like at the core that's who I am. I, I'm just like my sister and my cousins and you know regular ordinary people. You know what I mean? And I feel like I really appreciate that whenever I go there. Everyone's always so welcoming of anything and anything that they they even have an experience. They're welcome to it. They're like, I don't know what that is, but come on in. You want to play? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. I I would say that I, I carry um the pride of of no matter where I go in the world, I come from this small community and mm. and I represent the community that I was born in, which is St. Augustine, Florida, a little small town mm. down in Florida. And and um and then when my parents uh separated with me, we the other half of my life was in Connecticut. So I I, I like to say I'm from up south. Um <laughs> I have a little bit of, of the, the best of both worlds, but just the pride in being from this working class family that didn't have a whole lot. And all they gave me was the confidence that I could do anything in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really pretty much what they gave me, what they sent me out in the world with my family and my community. And, and, and I carry that with me and I instill it in my children and any other youngster that no matter where you go, you are still from some place that's mm -hmm. important to remember, which is what we as African-Americans, you know, we can't point to the place. Some of us can now because of 23andMe 
and Ancestry.com. But a lot of us can't reach all the way back. So reaching back to the ground that we came from in this country, I think, and representing that is, is what I take with me. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes. Well, as a native New Yorker, <laughs> native Manhattan New Yorker, like that is New York, because native New Yorkers, we don't count, sorry, uh, you know, the boroughs. <laughs> <laughs> no shades in the boroughs, but I'm just being real. I, you can send me, you know, <laughs> send your letters. Me, I'll get, I'll get letters. I get flack, but I'm just being real. <laughs> That's how we were brought up. It's New York, New York. Um, uh, it's just New York strong. Never mm -hmm. give up. Never. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just living through, you know, the age that I am living through the seventies in New York and New York was going down Then it came back up and then it went down and it came back up. Um, it's, it's, um, I carry that with me wherever I go, New York strong yes, and ma'am. we are, we survive. And how about you, Corey? You know, um, my father had 22 brothers and sisters and, um, yeah, and he was dead in the middle, 11 older, 11 younger. And um, the so, can I ask you from the same mother? <laughs> no, two different moms. First of all, I was worried about that woman. <laughs> <laughs> the second mom had 13 children, the same grandfather. And so, and then as I was growing up, um, I had my mother on my mother's side. My grandmother, uh, I had a great grand, uh, two great grandmothers that were still alive, a great great grandmother who was still alive. And so the thing that I learned the most from my hometown is that your family name means something. Mm. And that wherever you are, you are representing so many more people mm. than just yourself. And so I think that's that's something that I try to uh, live by and um, understand. So hmm. uh, beautiful. What did your yellow brick road to Broadway look like? Oh, that's mm. a good question. Mm. What did my yellow brick road to Broadway look like? Yeah. Well, um, I was, I, you know, so funny. I, I um. I tell people this all the time. I didn't come from a traditional musical theater education. I started as a dancer. And then when I got into New York as a dancer, my first job, I didn't like the way the dancers were being treated. So um, I started singing. And um, <laughs> I was like, this is shady. I shouldn't, why am I in the back on the side? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going out here a little bit and see what else I can do. But I, it's a funny story. I um, I again didn't have a traditional background, so I when when they were asking me, you know, to what can you sing a what's your up tempo? What's your ballad? I would I would my up tempo was "Ain't That Peculiar" by Shaka Khan, and my ballad was "Through the Fire." So these were my audition songs, and it, it was different than what I would hear the, the girls working in working on in the room prior to me. And um, God bless him, Timothy Graffin Reed, you know, amazing piano player for, and and court composer. He would be in there jamming out that song. You do to me wrong, so I'm crazy about you. This like young twenty year old girl singing some old shaka at an audition for Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> okay. so, it, so my yellow big road was not traditional. I was raised in a very strong black community and I brought everything black to my audience. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I didn't know a Sondheim ly lyric if you paid me. I didn't know a Christmas tune. I didn't know any of that. But, but I went in there confident. I could do it, and I got that. They got that Sondheim job singing some Chaka Khan. I tell you, look at that! Wow, yes. okay. wow, so hey. wow! I've never heard that, Lashans. I love. It. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a fantastic awesome. story. Wow. <laughs> so, but I know Gershwin now. So, and I know. Okay, see, exactly. exactly. <laughs> now I know it. Now I know you know all, all of it. it. Exactly. I know all. Of it. <laughs> but I do coming into this business. So. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you look back, and all of you have had such incredible opportunities in your careers, 
Um, what is something that you look back with, with just tremendous pride? And um, of course, everybody, like the question my students always ask is like, who is it or what was an experience that you thought, oh, Lordy, just get me through this or get me out of this? Mm. Get me through this or get me out of this. It's funny, the beginning of the question, I thought of a different moment and it may not answer it, but it may just answer it in a different way. But the film, being a part of the film Selma was um, an, an incredible, moment for me on many levels. Um, the universe was conspiring for me to do it. I was set to do my solo show in, in Philadelphia, and then that sort of fell apart. And because everything was saying, be a part of this, this will be a part of some change, some significant change in some way. And then you do hope that you're being used in many ways. I remember um, Maya Angelou passed away. And that same day, um, I'm, I was sitting in the makeup chair and I knew that Oprah was coming in um to get her makeup done and knew, knew how close they were and she comes in it's just the two of us somehow the universe deemed it to just be the two of us there with getting to hair and makeup and she was also happens to be she was um trying to buy that sports team that i think that she was trying to buy a football team or something a basketball team remember that over some years ago mm. it was all during the same time so she's on the phone negotiating you know millions <laughs> upon millions, billions of dollars whatever mm -hmm. and then she gets off and then i looked at her and I could tell she took took an exhale and I just reached over. Now, Oprah, and I, we've known each other enough, not like this, but in, instinct told me to just reach over and grab it, hold her hand. And I sat there and I just held her hand and we just sat there and I just wanted her to know we, we were here for her, that's it. And then of course I made a joke because I'm silly and I said, so, um, Oprah, can I borrow $5? <laughs> I know you're good for it, I heard you on the phone. I know you're good for it. And she was like, you're so silly, Coleman. And we just laughed. But in that moment, I felt like my purpose was to hold the hand of one of the most powerful women in the world. Mm -hmm. And in this moment, she's grieving. And I, I knew that it, because I feel like a lot of times people, they come up with a lot of things about Oprah or they put up barriers or something like that. And I was like, nope, I'm gonna just hold her hand and we're gonna sit here. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even gonna talk about it. I'm gonna just try to make you laugh a little bit. And we held our hands for maybe a couple minutes. And then we talked about intention and the science of intention. And I just watched, you know, I would just have, it was just a moment where I felt like, oh, I feel very grateful that I was a part of this moment of helping someone in the, their time of need, especially someone who you think has so much agency in the world. And, but then you're like, in its most simplistic form, we just need somebody to hold our hand. And you mm. feel like, oh, maybe I was there for that moment, you know? Maybe maybe it was about, you never know why we're supposed to be in a room or to do a project, but I always feel like it's always so much more than, than just doing the show or doing the film. It's like, I'm supposed to be there for a significant moment, you know? Wow. That's yeah. so interesting. I mean, I've, I've heard that story before and I just love it so much. It's about, about, stand, about being in your purpose and not knowing sometimes why you are where you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know, the old folks say, you know, we'll understand it. After a while, you know, mm -hmm. all that looking back. I don't know why I'm quoting. I don't, I'm quoting. <laughs> <laughs> oh. educate, educate Sharon. That's yeah, it. That's right. <laughs> but, but, well, but, well, Sharon and I had a conversation the other day talking about how we become the aunties and the uncles, and we do a lot of quotes now. We always <laughs> quote like the old folks when we realize we're the old folks now. We, <laughs> and we're like, we're the old folks. We used to be baby girl. Right, we don't vote now. Right? Um, Continue, Sharon. I'm sorry. No, but no, no. It made me think of. I was going to give a different answer, Corey, when you asked about. You know, it came out of being a New Yorker. It was the first time I was on stage at in the Delacorte because I grew up going to the Delacorte. It was the first time I saw people of color speaking the speech. Speaking. I remember seeing. You know, two gentlemen of Vermont. Was the first time in that big state with all these color, brown and. Black and it was just so to stand on that stage mm -hmm. when I did, you know, when I did Lady Anne, that was like, that was huge. That was one of those watershed moments for me. But, mm. but talking about being in your purpose was, um, I was doing my show, I was doing my solo show and it was the first time, it was in Pittsburgh, it was at City Theater. And um, I was there alone the night of the election. Mm. And, mm. and uh, 
And I was all ready to, we were going to celebrate the first woman president. And I had a show that night mm -hmm. and I had, I was going to zoom with my girls and we were all going to watch and, and uh, we all know how that night went. And uh, you know, we, it was, it, we were all so, it was just so devastating. And uh, I had two shows the next day and I, I was in Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania swung red. And I thought, and I was doing a matinee and I thought, Who's coming to this matinee? Hmm. Who, who's, who? I knew who my audience was going to be for that matinee in Pittsburgh. And I thought, why am I doing that? I, I don't think I can do the show. And I had a long talk with the artistic director. I knew I had to do the show. And anyway, I, I did my show. It was one of the hardest things I'd ever done. I came out and I stood on that stage by myself and I looked around at this all white audience of older people. And I was, I was, you, know, you probably voted this way. You know, I was all, all this thing. And then I stopped and I, I did my show. And at the end, this older, I'll never forget it. This older white woman came up to me and she said with tears in her eyes, you couldn't be more different than me, but I just saw my father. Mm. And I thought, <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. I guess that's why I did this show mm -hmm. today in this moment. Mm. And so that was, so that's two different answers to your question, but it's, it was a real, another one of those, this is why we do what we do. Cause she may never have seen anybody in her life that looked like me or had a conversation, mm -hmm. but she did that afternoon. Mm. So. Wow. wow. That's when you know you are being used. Yes. Yeah, so in that moment. That's when you know you're you're not even you're just we're just vessels. And I believe that's what we all are anyway. Yep. You know, yep. I'm here for you, you're here for me. That's you know, right. I teach my children that all the time that you know what you do isn't for you. It's in service to everyone else on the planet. Mm -hmm. but, um hmm. those are very powerful, powerful stories. I would have to say that it was uh back when I was doing once on this island, it was my first foray into this industry and um my first leading role and um i was so was so blown away i i, I always had my i always walked around the world with blinders on everything in front i there's something my mom told me just keep going forward don't let the what's on the side get in the way just keep going forward keep going forward it was for you it's for you that person can have what's for them what's for them but you gotta say and you know keep your eye on the prize and um i was just working and i was always I would often come off stage and come out of the dressing room. I mean, come out of the backstage when people would be standing out there crying and wanting to hug me and wanting to give me things. And I was always like, what is happening? What, what, what is it? How, how is it so powerful that people are moved to where they want to hug me? Because I never felt that it was me. I always felt that I was doing what I was supposed to be doing but not, it wasn't me. I, I, it's, it's hard for me to explain mm -hmm. what I'm saying, but I would, I would be, I would enjoy what I was doing on stage and have a great time as we all know, but there was something that was transformative about it that, that, um, that I never took ownership of in the way that people were, were responding. And I learned the power of theater at that time. It was it was what I, when I learned that we can really affect how people leave the building, mm -hmm. we can change people's mm -hmm. state, we can give them hope, we can inspire them. And I, I learned that during Once on the Island. That was, so I, I, I'm grateful for that experience for that reason. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, there are, a million more questions that I could easily ask, mm -hmm. but I and I recognize that I am over the time that I had asked you all for. Um, so I will um, have one final question, if you don't mind, which is still once more geared towards the younger artist. And I know that we have spoken about this before, but. Um, um, somehow these things end up on YouTube and forever. And if there is a message that has to be sent out that you want to send out, um, what do you say? What do you say to those young artists? And uh, you answered the question once before for just getting out of college, but um, 
<laughs> what are those words? And if you I, say, I, make my answer I, from before. I, good. I think you want to get started by. Um, I, I remember when um, I was on a panel when I was back in San Francisco in the early '90s, and I was so impressed when I heard this woman, Joy Carlin, um, older Bay Area actress, you know, told. Um, someone asking about like, someone said, oh, you know, I've gone to conservatory, I've studied this, that this, that, I went to college for this, I got grad school, blah, 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 whatever. She said, great, wonderful. Um, she says, what you need to do now is live a life. Don't let it just be about your studies and your training, that's all important. She said, but have an interest in things outside of this because you're gonna need those things. You're gonna need all those other interests. You're gonna need, you're gonna, have to make room for love. You know, the, the idea that people say, oh, I don't have time for that. I have to focus on my career. No, 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 no. You need all that. You need a, you need love. You need relationships. You need to have a family. You need to start a family if you want one, if you want children, if you, <clears throat> whatever it is, to know that, to look forward to having a fullness in your life because you're going to need that for those times when you're not working, for when we are pausing. When we were, you're going to have to have other things to hold on to that's going to f give you fuel. So when you're back on that stage or you're, you know, performing something or you get those opportunities, you're, you're coming with a whole lot of um, other joys upon joys. That's true. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mm -hmm. share that, Coleman. That's wonderful. Thank um, you, I, I would like to speak to um, those, to those youngsters that feel that they're alone in mm -hmm. what doing. I just want to uh, remind them that um, you may feel isolated, you may feel alone, you may feel, particularly during during COVID, that, that, that you don't have someone to lean on or you may, or you may feel isolated. Um, I just want to speak to that person at those, those kids and say, you're not alone because you're a part of a community. You're an artist. You're a part of a community that is here that is here to support you. And all it takes is you reaching out. If it's shooting a DM, if it's, you know, signing up for a group, a group discussion, if it's um, reaching out and, and it's so much easier now than it was for us. You can speak to people all over the world. You can speak to your heroes you can send messages. Just don't be alone. Don't know that you're not alone. When you feel that way, reach out. Don't be alone in your, in your discomfort reach out and know that we are here and we support you and that we've all been there. You're not alone. So don't don't believe that lie. It's a lie. The enemy's a liar. Right. I mean, Come on. Come on. A lie. It's a liar. You're not alone. Don't do not go through the world feeling that you are. You are not. You may not feel it around you immediately, but we're here in the whole community of theater and artists. We're all in the same place and we're here for you. I love that. I love that. And I would say, um, because I am a Virgo and a perfectionist, and I always wanted to be perfect, don't be afraid to be messy. Hmm. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's really okay. You find a safe place because that's the only way you're going to grow. Is it? and and all of I would all of these artists, all of my friends on this panel, Coleman, Lashans, we will. I I know we will tell you the same thing that in our path in our growth there's always a moment when you still feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Yep. yep. And I have to step out and be like, well, I don't know what this is. It's scary, but you have to be just don't be afraid because there's so much in our society now is about being perfect and being right and being in the No, that's that's so not art. It's messy. Art comes from the messy places. You find stories in the messy places, in the scary places, in the places where you, I don't know what I'm doing. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Mm. But just don't be afraid mm. to yeah. be messy. Mm. It does, it adds color to the craft. Y'all, um, Sharon Washington, Coleman Domingo, LaShawn's, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you so much for um, agreeing to this. Um, this has, when sometimes um, what uh, Stephen Schwartz said, 
time weaves ribbons of memories to sweeten life when youth is through. Um, so you look back on those things that just make things wonderful. And this past hour is going to be one of those things I will take with me forever. Mm. So thank you so much. Cool. And, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm rejuvenated. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. People coming out of retirement and things. Come on out of retirement. Come on yeah. out. The water's wet. That's it. <laughs> okay. And this has been great to spend time with everybody, too. Yes, really lovely. Really lovely. I'm so happy to have been a part of this. So great to be in the swap room with you all. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, all right. Uh, Charlotte, um, look for our announcement. We've only got two more of these. And so um, the announcement of who's next will be coming forth, uh, coming soon. And until then, have a good night, y'all. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Be well. Take care.